Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for the Outdoor Art Club presentation of Beauty and the Beast, California Wildflowers and Climate Change. I'm Lois Ashley, and I'm working with my team member, Robin Geisler, to bring you this program. The Outdoor Art Club is a nonprofit organization in Mill Valley, which hosts this public speaker series. The speakers look forward to answering all of your questions, so please send those to the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Now I'd like to introduce our program chair, Barbara Robertson. We are honored to have with us today internationally acclaimed conservation photographers, Rob Badger and Nita Winter. Among their honors, Rob and Nita recently received the Sierra Club's Ansel Adams Award for Conservation Photography. Their coffee table book, Beauty and the Beast, California Wildflowers and Climate Change, co-published with the California Native Plant Society, has received 12 awards. Rob and Nita are excited to take you behind the scenes of their 27-year journey photographing wildflowers throughout California and the West and share with you the making of their stunning award-winning book. Without further ado, here are Rob Badger and Nita Winter. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. We are so happy to be here. We've looked forward to this for quite a while. So thank you all for taking your time in the middle of your day to come listen to us talk about our 27-year journey photographing wildflowers on our public lands throughout the West and with a really intense focus on California. So we'll take you on our, on our journey and... Um... We will be open for questions at the end, and we'll have to figure out how we're going to do that exactly, because I don't know if the chat or Q&A are open to the public at the moment. But if they are, that's where you can put your questions. This project was a very collaborative project. There's no way Rob and I could have done this together. We're experts at photographing wildflowers, but not necessarily finding them and naming them. So we co-published our book with the California Native Plant Society. And without the local chapter members, we would not have known necessarily where to go. And um, so it's, um, we, we really wanna thank them for, for all that they've done. We also wanted diversity in the Voices for Wildflowers and worked with a lot of different people from a lot of different organizations. For those of you who might have to leave early, you can learn more about us and buy books at wildflowerbooks.com. And that's also where our contact information is. So this all started in 1992 when I was at a film lab in San Francisco uh, processing some landscape photography I had, I had done earlier. I met a friend of mine, Liz Hymans, uh, was a really good nature photographer. And she said, you know, the Antelope Valley California Poppy Reserve, which is about an hour north of LA, is having a really, really incredible year after six dismal bad drought years. She, she said, you know, you're a landscape photographer in California, and I'm sure that you've been to the Poppy Reserve multiple times. You've been doing this for a while. I said, you know, kind of sheepishly, well, no, I really I really haven't, I haven't been there. She said, well, you and I have to go down. We have to see this place and we have to leave really, really soon. So a couple of days later, she and a friend of ours and I went down, drove down from San Francisco, about a six, six and a half hour drive down and uh, came to the Poppy Reserve. And just, uh, this is the first time I had ever seen anything like this. There was just this amazing, I mean, truly amazing carpet of multicolored flowers. And what made this year so unusual was normally the poppy reserve would have a lot of densely packed orange California poppies without a whole lot of other colors. But this year was very, very different because you can see there were, were these small purple tipped birds, igelias uh, scattered in amongst the, uh, the flowers. So it made this a very, very unusual uh, and colorful composition in in this reserve. So um, well, I want you to imagine I was standing there in front of this field of flowers in a windy area and you could see 
these waves of wind moving, undulating across these flowers, moving in into the distance. I could see these multiple waves. So not only was it a beautiful, colorful landscape, but it was also a beautiful moving landscape. So that evening I called Nita and I said, hey, sweetie, you know, you, you, you really have to see this. I've never seen anything like this before. Um, I don't want you to miss this. If, if, the, if it heats up, if it gets drier, we, we may lose the poppies in just a few days. So I drove back after doing some photography and got Nita and we came down to this area uh, north of LA, like I said, about an hour north of LA and began our first wildflower photography together. And Rob and I had both grown up in uh, the Northeast, Rob in New England, and I was from Long Island. And we had never seen anything like this because obviously New England doesn't have these types of wildflower spreads. And so we were hooked. Um, this was where the 27 year journey started. I met Rob in a photo lab and uh, <clears throat> I was waiting for my prints and this print showed up and thank you. We've thank been you. together for 36 years. I was a people photographer when we started and that's a photo from the Children of the Tenderloin series and Rob was uh, mainly a landscape nature photographer. And we just decided once we saw those wildflowers that we would spend a lot more time and eventually join forces and um, focus solely, almost solely on the wildflowers. So one of the uh, most frequent questions we get asked is, well, how far back does your wildflower photography go? This image was taken on film in 1984, a uh, couple of years before I met Nita. I was looking for a really uh, dramatic example of a beautiful California buckeye tree. And uh, as I was scouting the landscape, I came across this area with these beautiful purple flowers in front of the tree and, and also behind the tree. I didn't know what these flowers were at the time, but I thought this would be a, a really nice addition to this whole portrait of a California buckeye. So this was in 1984. It's the earliest image in the book. Uh, as Nita mentioned, when she met me, I had been photographing uh, in California for, for quite a while. And after doing a lot of nature and landscape photography. I just wanted to do more with my images than uh, have them appear in notes or calendars or books or cards or things like that. So Nita suggested, well, you know, you've got a good body of work. We've been doing this for years. Why don't you uh, contact some of these land conservation agencies? So I uh, got in touch with the Trust for Public Land, uh, which is a national land conservation agency and they over the years they hired me to do over 30 projects throughout the west um, this is an example of one of their projects this is privately held ranch land that at that time was adjacent to sequoia national park this was in the in the sierra foothills and so uh, the uh, park system uh, found this particular uh, area had a lot of ecological value, say, so they wanted to acquire it for their park. They worked with the Trust for Public Land, and eventually this private land became part of Sequoia National Park. I'd, uh, I also began doing a lot of environmental issues work. I was working on a project on mining on public land and the devastating effects that was happening to our public lands. Uh, I was also dealing with uh, water issues and uh, forestry issues. And after doing that for about 10 years, it just got to be so depressing going to all these places. I, I just finally stopped doing that work and decided I was going to focus exclusively on using the beauty of what was left on our public lands to help promote uh, conservation work and inspire hope and action that we could save all the species that are left on our beautiful public lands. Well, I went to uh, Clark University in Worcester, Massachusetts, and my while I was there, my whole family moved to California, and I came out here in the mid-70s, and one of the first jobs I 
Scott was as a firefighter in Leggett in Northern Mendocino County. And I was the first female firefighter in that area um, at, at that station over 13 years. And this was, a I always kept a, a camera, a point and shoot camera on my belt. And I was coming up from the Eel River north of Leggett and took this photograph. These were land moving equipment tires that were burning. And that's why the smoke was so black. Um, and I won my first international award from Nikon for this photograph. The image on the left was from my first major exhibit as a professional photographer, and it was on the children of the Tenderloin. And it launched my career working on creating healthy communities, um, both for families and children. On the left here is uh, an image I took at a powwow at San Francisco State. It was hand colored by Taya Schrack and used, uh, commissioned by the, um, Children's Defense Fund. I did a lot of their calendars and other uh, publications. And on the right was a series that I created called The Faces of, um, first Marin City, where Rob and I moved. And then this was the canal and uh, we did a number of them. And these were seven foot banners that hung in the streets to celebrate diversity, whether it's age diversity, ethnic diversity, sexual preference, et cetera. And so, I was doing the people photography and after a while I was having some health issues and started to back off on the assignment work and that allowed me free time to go out and spend more time in the field with Rob. This is an image uh, that uh, someone uh, took of us when we were photographing wildflowers uh, south of Lake Tahoe uh, in uh, El Dorado National Forest the Carson Pass area. Um, we chose this area because we had learned that this was where uh, different bioregions converged. And what that meant to us was there'd be a greater variety of wildflowers to photograph and easily accessible uh, in, a, in a small area. So uh, we, I, I was carrying about 85 pounds of gear that include uh, backpacking gear, food and our uh, what we call our natural light studio. We'll talk more uh, about that later. Uh, Nita was carrying 65 pounds. Normally the wildflower photography we do, we do on day trips, uh, but we decided we were going to backpack in so we could spend as much time as possible getting photographs of these beautiful uh, of these beautifully diverse flowers. And I said after that, I was not going to carry 65 pounds again up to about 7,000 feet, um, but it was 9, worth 9,000, excuse me, but it was worth doing it on that trip. And one of the things that was really interesting about this trip was um, and an illustration of what's happening with climate change. There had been so much snow that year that the wildflowers were three to four weeks late. Um, later than they normally were. So we were out after Labor Day. Um, you can't see many flowers here, but slightly higher elevation. There were still a lot of flowers out. And we'll talk a little more about how this um, timing issue can be a, a problem for both flowers and for um, uh, the pollinators. And in order to be able to pay for the work that we were doing, we were fortunate to connect with our consultants and architects and help um, enhance the environment of medical facilities. And this was an eight foot tall by 20 foot wide lobby dividers. There were seven of them, different colors. And they, we had 34 images built into this architect, I mean, excuse me, into this hospital. They also used our fine art framed work as well. So this image of California poppies is part of a series I call the contact series where I get the flower petals gently in touch with the front of the lens. I'll talk more about that later when we take you behind the scenes and, ex and explain how we get our wildflower photographs out in the field. We can photograph flowers out here in the Bay Area 12 months of the year, but there aren't very many in the winter. So we like to go out to places like Woodbridge Ecological Preserve near Lodi, or Merced National Wildlife Refuge to photograph the birds. 
And then these images are also, again, used in healthcare facilities. And not everything is strict um, interpretations or records of what we saw. We also have the fun, since we spend so much time um, photographing one flower, we were up on a bluff above San Gregorio Beach and this young um, red-tailed hawk decided to check us out. I do not have a telephoto lens on. This bird was right over my head. Oh, what a very frequent question we get asked is, do you have a favorite uh, super bloom? Yes, yes, we do. Well, in 2003, above the town of Gorman, where Interstate 5 crosses the Tehachapis from Los Angeles over into the Central Valley, above that town, about a, a hundred, about 1,200 feet high from the freeway base to the top of the ridge, you know, mile and a half wide, was completely covered with flowers. This is a detail of some of the flowers that we saw by the freeway. And we were fortunate that there is public land on the west side of the freeway. The freeway goes between these two hills and we were able to drive up on the west side and look back across to the east and that is private land and we're hoping that someday that this will be protected. So what made this so interesting and so beautiful and also so challenging was the fact that we had arrived at the tail end of a, a spring storm. It was about the beginning week in April. And as the storm was clearing, we saw these beautiful shafts of sunlight moving across these, these flowers and with an intense dark gray background where some of the clouds were that hadn't cleared. So it, it was uh, challenging and exciting to photograph this because the landscape was constantly changing. And as I said before, we had a vantage point, we could see a mile and a half wide of all these different flowers. So it was the most incredible bloom we've seen and we haven't seen anything in that area since. Again, that was in 2003 and I'd been driving up and down that road since 1966 and I'd never seen anything like that. So it was truly an incredible bloom, like something we've never seen before. And they called it a 50 year bloom. And we don't know what's gonna happen this year with it um, because it's a higher elevation than some of the other areas. Our second favorite bloom was Carrizo Plain. And that's going pretty bonkers this year as well. I don't think as good in the mountains um, as 2017. And this is, uh, coming from the Bakersfield side over the Tembler Range into the Carrizo Plain. And this is an interesting illustration of the difference between a north-facing slope and a south-facing slope. South-facing slopes are hotter and drier, and therefore you have fewer, fewer, flowers, yeah. fewer flowers. On the west side is the Caliente Mountains. So the Carrizo Plain runs north and south, with these two mountain ranges. And the Carrizo Plain is about 60 miles long and what, about 15 miles wide? Yeah, it's the largest intact native grassland in the state. And it, preser it preserves an amazing uh, abundance and variety of flowers. And so I'll show you this while we're talking about it and then we'll go back to the desert candles. So this is looking west, the east, toward, and Bakersfield is over the hills. Another frequent question we get asked is, well, um, you've, you've probably photographed hundreds of flowers. Do you have a favorite one or do you have favorite ones? Well, uh, yes, we had heard about this beautiful desert candle, which is a member of the mustard family. People said, you really have to photograph this flower. It's really unusual. So we came across this amazing display of desert candles. And this was an, another um, landscape where the flowers were gently moving so in, in the breeze. So one reason we like this as a favorite flower is because of its color, its shape, uh, this long stem that's about uh, maybe two feet tall is hollow. And when it's backlit, it seems to glow. 
and we have these beautiful intense magenta buds that open into these delicate white flowers and then at the base are these pretty deep uh, these brilliant green lance shaped leaves so that's a really really unusual flower we haven't seen anything like that so i i would think it's our favorite or maybe one of our favorites and it's in the mustard family which is interesting and now we're going to see a detail of this big expanse of flowers and this are tiny tips and phasalia. And this was taken with my iPhone 6. So many of these images, almost all the uh, actual flower images are in the book. And we realized we used 12 different cameras over the uh, 27 years from the iPhone to film cameras, Hasselblad and Canon cameras to a lot of different generations of digital cameras. So I mentioned earlier that we'd like to take people behind the scenes and show them how it is we photograph the flowers in the field without without hurting them. So on the on the left page, this is a spread that's in the book. Uh, on the left page in the upper left hand corner is an, a, an example of what we call a botanical portrait where so we isolate the flower from the background. We put black or white backgrounds behind the flowers. Uh, the intent is to show as much detail with as much clarity and get the accurate color of the flower as we can. So that's a typical botanical portrait. Uh, after putting fabrics behind these flowers uh, on the background, it became re repetitive. And I was wondering if, well, there was a, another different way we could do this. So. I noticed one day I looked at the folds of the fabric behind these flowers and I said, well, what if I arrange the folds in the fabric to complement the uh, the flower and add to the overall comp composition? So I started doing this. I went through about four or five different fabrics before I found that uh, that chiffon, which is a very, very lightweight fabric, takes more gracefully curved uh, fold. So I, um, I began using that both white chiffon backgrounds and black chiffon back backgrounds. And we'll show you examples of the white one later. And this became called the wrap series. Oh, thank you. I forgot. <laughs> uh, so another way I photograph is, as I mentioned earlier, when Nita was describing our work that's being used, used for healthcare environments, I found that uh, there was a, a way that I could safely, for the flower, get the flower petals and other parts of the flower gently in contact with the filter in front of a wide angle lens. And so because the, the camera and the lens uh, prevented the light that was falling onto the flower uh, from being seen, the light would be reflected off the flower like in the other portraits you saw. Uh, that light was unavailable because it was being blocked. So the light available for the photograph was light coming from behind the flower. Sometimes it was sky, sometimes it was light reflected off of whatever was behind the flower. So I, I developed this series. As far as I know, no one else does this. And I call it the contact series. And it was uh, another way to show the beauty of the flowers, but uh, show the beauty in a little bit more abstract way. And uh, I always made sure there, there were plenty of areas in the scene that were in sharp focus so people could see some of the details of these beautiful flowers. And in order to do that, you do need to put a extension tube on the back of the, between the lens and the camera in order to be able to focus that close. Uh, another question we get asked is, well, uh, how long does it take a f to photograph a flower? Well, Nita mentioned earlier that it takes about an hour to do a flower from the time that we uh, drop all our gear that we're carrying, set up, put different uh, backgrounds behind the flowers and photograph at different angles. Uh, it takes about an hour. This was the longest flower composition it took took about two and a half hours and Nita can explain that. And one of the reasons it took so long is we were still doing 
um, film. This is a Hasselblad, which has a Polaroid back. And there's a Polaroid in Rob's hand that he had just pulled in order to be able to see what the light was doing, um, as opposed to digital made it much more, much easier to do this work. Uh, besides the fact that we didn't have to carry film, we could see exactly what we were getting right away. So the I had found this flower the night before and it was getting too late. So we came back early the next morning and had directional light coming from the left, had to put in reflectors in order to fill in the light uh, in, the, in the area that was being shaded and then also create a pile of jackets and camera gear to shade the sand and the leaves so that you didn't have uh, bright highlights. And this was the final image. And what, this, what, what made this uh, an unusual lily image was the fact that normally these desert, beautiful desert lilies grow to be two, two and a half feet tall and they had blossoms coming off this one uh, stem going up to the top of the flower. Well, th this particular plant, as you saw before, was pretty low to the ground. It put out uh, three different stems, therefore it put out a lot of flowers. So this was a high rain year in El Nino event rain year in 1998. And this, this beautiful flower was just putting out an incredible amount of blossoms for for our, the seed bank for future flower generations. We live in Marin City. Um, most of you are probably local, but in case you don't know that, it's five miles north of the Golden Gate Bridge. And we love photographing in Marin County because there is just so much biodiversity here and different ecosystems from the coast to the top of Mount Tamalpais. And I was really fortunate to have Rob be a workhorse. He would carry all that equipment. He was willing to be in really uncomfortable positions and um, is a Capricorn, so was very patient and really good with detail. I, having photographed people, would, be, would work much more quickly, but I also had this wonderful um, ability to see. I was called the eagle eyes as a kid because I would find money on the beach and I was able to use that with flowers. I was able to find things that a lot of people would have missed. And um, so it was very much a team uh, project. The photographs are his, hers, and ours. Yeah, we call us Team Sweetie. So this, this is another example of a black background behind the, behind the flower. Uh, we use diffusion discs that we'll show you later to soften the light, but often we don't need that if we photograph uh, where, in, where there are lots of clouds in the sky. A soft diffused light softens the overall feeling of the flower. So this is an example of a portrait we did on Ring Mountain near here where we didn't need a lot of equipment. We use, as Rob mentioned, both black and white backgrounds, often doing both and then taking them home and, and deciding which one we like better. And sometimes different applications would uh, be better with a black or a white. One of the things we have to deal with is wind. This is the Marin Headlands and it is very windy, as you know. And so in this case, in order to photograph anything, we had to send, set up a wind tent. We had been looking for a really nice example of a Franciscan paintbrush that uh, the species that lives in the Bay Area. So we found this one, as Nidia said, in Rodeo Beach area. And after getting the uh, entire blossom of the plant, I looked at it very, very closely at the top and I said, gee, what if I look really, uh, uh, what if I come in very, very tightly and just do the top of the plant? So we don't always show the entire plant. Sometimes we're looking for a beautiful abstract way to show the beauty of this plant. So um, it looked to us like this was a really nice scarlet flame that was coming out of the top of this plant. 
And we are very careful about where we'll work. I mean, if it's a if it's an invasive grass, um, we don't mind pushing it aside. But almost all of our work is done at the edge of the road or the edge of a trail. Um, if we can't find, if a specimen that we find that we want to photograph is not accessible without doing damage, we will bypass it and go and look for another one. And this is up on Mount Tamalpais. And we don't always photograph from the front. Sometimes it's more interesting to get a flower from the back or the side. Some of the flowers are really wonderful for their fragrance. This in particular is the Western Azalea. And this is along the Stagecoach Road on the way to um, West Point Inn. This is Nita's image of a uh... A Shasta of a, iris. thank you of a Shasta iris in Plumas Forest, not too far from, uh, not not too far from Quincy. Quincy, yeah. yeah. And as Rob mentioned, sometimes we'll use a diffusion disc to soften the light. What that allows us to do is to photograph any time of day. Um, the best time to do landscapes is usually uh, around sunrise or sunset, and the during the day, the light gets too harsh, but the diffusion disc allows us um, not only to soften the light, but also to direct the light, to see where we want it uh, to come from. And in this case, we set it behind the flower because we wanted it to come through the stalk of the, of the flower to look like it was lit from within. And then we set up a reflector in front of the camera um, to bounce like back in and fill in the shadows. And you may be able to see that this is another example of the of the wrap series where we wrap the folds around the plant to complement the entire composition. And this image um, is the the largest wildflower that we have photographed. And we decided to use this as a sampler for our new project that we are working on raising funds to create. And that's an audio described version of our book and talk and exhibit for the visually impaired. So imagine that you can't see our photographs. We wanna be able to bring, to create a picture in the mind's eye of people who, who can't see this and uh, bring them into our world and the world of, the, of, the, um, of us as photographers. And our world as photographers and also that of the wildflower. And if you go to our website and click on videos, you can see a sample of how we audio describe this image. This is a beautiful uh, ground iris we found on Ring Mountain, which is one of our two favorite places to photograph wildflowers close to home. And uh, this is another example of of the rap series that I mentioned earlier. And that's Mount Tamalpais in the background. And it was protected because it's got wonderful wildflower blooms, but especially because of this flower, the Tiburon mariposa lily that grows in several locations on Ring Mountain and nowhere else in the world. And that's one that's late. It's usually May or June after most of the other flowers are gone. Oh, and I just wanna back up a second. And people ask about climate change and wildflowers and what we're finding with um, as the rains get heavier, there are more super blooms. Um, but also what's happening this year, the weather is much colder. So the bloom is, is the timing of the bloom is very different than it normally is. And you're seeing that up in Ring Mountain. This is an area that we hike to. It's 11,000 feet in the Eastern Sierra Morgan Pass. We were up there looking for true alpine flowers. This was a beautiful collection of the pygmy daisy, uh, again, part of the wrap series. So we've hiked to uh, uh, 11,000 feet in Colorado, up to 13,000 feet to get some of these beautiful alpine wildflowers. And down to below sea level in Death Valley. On the way back from Morgan Pass, we came across this beautiful alpine columbine and wrapped the flower with these graceful curves uh, around, the, uh, uh, around the blossom without showing the rest of the plant. 
And columbines is one of my favorite flowers. Oh, that's right. I forgot to say that. We photograph flowers in sunlight. We photograph flowers under diffuse light. We photograph this one in the sunlight because of the beautiful uh, uh, sparkling uh, pieces. I don't specular know. Specular highlights. Yeah, thank you. The specular highlights on this, on the uh, leaves of this iris. And then we uh, photograph the same flower using a diffusion disc like we showed before in the same position. And you can see how the feeling of this beautiful blossom changes under soft light. So that's one reason why it takes so much time for us to photograph the flowers because uh, often we're photographing them under different light conditions. And I just want to mention, this is not when we photograph the iris. For those of you who know, the iris is probably would not be out when the grasses are dry. This is up on Ring Mountain again. But we just wanted to show you how we use the diff one of the ways we use the diffusion disk. Another really important question that people ask us, well, you know, how much Photoshop work do you do? Well, we do a lot of Photoshop work, and that's that's because the file format that we photographed in is called a raw format. It's got the raw data coming off the uh, camera sensor, and that has to be converted into uh, pixel data, uh, color data. So this is an example of what uh, came out of the camera, the raw file. The, the camera uh, sensor captures the exact color of light that's falling on the scene. In this scene, uh, the light source was the blue sky that was overhead. We were in the shade. So the camera captured the uh, color of the blue light on the scene. The blossoms had a blue tinge to them in the raw file. And our brains correct for this blue light. So we don't see the blue light, but the film or the camera will pick it up. So the camera sensor is also designed to capture as great a, a range of light as possible from dark to uh, very, very bright. So that gives uh, us a very, very low contrast image, a lower contrast image than you would see with your eye. And it's also designed to capture as many different subtle uh, colors of light. So the raw file gives you a very uh, uh, low saturated image. So what we do in Photoshop is all the color correction and contrast and um, saturation to bring the scene back to what anyone would see if they were there looking at the same scene we were. We also may have issues with our backgrounds that we put in there. They may not be, um, they may have wrinkles in them, they may have spots on them, they may not be they may have light on them, so we take them into Photoshop and we clean up the background. But it does start with a black or white background. This is an image. Is uh, these are two page two page spreads that are in the book. We also deal with um, wind, as I mentioned before. In this case, we're right on the edge of a road that's sandy, and the um, wild buckeye is really low to the ground, so we took two pieces of fabric in order to slip it underneath. But as you can see, there's a lot of sand on the, on the background. It's low contrast, low saturation, take it into Photoshop and we clean it up and um, bring it back to what we saw. And again, how it appears in our book. Not only are we dealing with the wind, we also deal with heat. We deal with rain, and in this case in Utah, we've had a, had our worst experience with bugs. Um, many of you may know the noceums. Noceums are a lot worse than mosquitoes. They're absolutely tiny. They're relentless. They will go in your nose, in your ears, and um, try to get anywhere um, where they can get access into your clothes to get access to blood. And we were in the middle of nowhere on our way from Capitol Reef National Park to Taos, New Mexico. I saw these flowers and I um, 
we stopped and within about three to five minutes, the no seams had found us. So I had to go back to the car, get some clean underwear so we could wear it to keep them out of our ears. And I was really curious, why did these bugs show up when we were there? It wasn't like they had followed us. We were, you know, hours away, hours away. So I did some research and I found that these uh, biting bugs uh, normally sustain themselves on the nectar of flowers. So they were there, they were at the flowers. Uh, they use the nectar for nourishment, but they need the blood from a mammal to reproduce. So these bugs were, were there when we showed up, they sensed us and they found a way to get what they needed to reproduce. And we had just spent days in Capitol Reef photographing wildflowers and Rob was often the one on the ground and um, they were just torturing him. So we figured he had over 200 bites um, from that experience and they itch longer the, and worse than mosquito bites. And fortunately, we don't haven't experienced them in, in California. We have had some bad mosquitoes um, up in the Sierra Mountains. So we met somebody from the San Francisco Library who asked us to create a California focused um, exhibit. And we had been photographing throughout the West. So this, so we created Beauty and the Beast, California Wildflowers and Climate Change. And it hung at the Jewett Gallery in San Francisco. And it had a hundred images in it. And we also had um, displays of different things that were important for our work, which included um, guides for flowers. Um, binoculars are really great to use when you're looking for flowers. And as well as these knee pads that we found another photographer on Mount Rainier wearing. They're like kneeling in stiff jello when you're spending that much time on your knees. It's really important. And we will be sending out, or um, the Outdoor Art Club will be sending out a follow up email with some of this information on it. So finding these knee pads made it so much easier to spend, for me to spend so much more time on the ground because as I said before, it takes us about an hour to do a flower. And uh, it, it just, I, my knees were much more comfortable uh, kneeling on, uh, you know, uneven rocky terrain. They're also great if you're gardening or anything on your knees. So the, the exhibit, half of the exhibit became a traveling exhibit that currently is at Morrow Bay Nat Natural History Museum. Um, and we were fortunate to have the San Diego Natural History Museum um, invite us to create a custom large print version for them. It was called California Blooming, Wildflowers and Climate Change in the Golden State, and it was up for about a year and a half. And here's an example of them hanging it. And some of the prints went 12 feet tall. And we had educational panel, panels um, throughout the exhibit but we wanted to expand on that with a coffee table book. And so we invited a number of authors. In this case, we ended up with 16 authors who wrote 18 short personal stories about their expertise or their experience. And they ranged in age from 20 to 82. People like Jose Gonzalez, um, who's the founder of um, Latino Outdoors, who wrote about his connection to nature Wendy Takuda wrote about um, the restoration work she's doing. So we were, out of the eight, 16 authors, 11 were women. We wanted to give diverse voices. So the book is divided into three sections, the gift of beauty, the human connection, and ensuring the future. So our projects were about inspiring hope and action around climate change, land conservation, species extinction. And we wanted to inspire people, but not just leave them hanging. So in ensuring the future, there is uh, there are 25 things you can do to make a difference. Um, so we're encouraging people to take, take the actions that they're comfortable with. And over time, maybe pick a few more. So the short stories, uh, were, we have uh, Wildflowers and Climate Change by Gordon Lepic, who's with the California uh, Fish and Wildlife 
department, uh, Ryan Burnett with uh, Point Blue Conservation Science. This is a story that talks about uh, chasing spring, timing everything. It, it addresses the issue of the timing of natural events. And that, that uh, information is called phenology, uh, how things relate to each other during the changing of the seasons. So in this case, he's studying in the uh, mountain meadows um, in the Sierra Mountains in order to see how climate change is affecting the timing of the wildflower blooms. As I mentioned earlier, we had you know, flowers that were three to four weeks late. And what that does is interfere with the available fuel for the Rufus hummingbird, which has an epic migration from Mexico to the Northwest and even to Alaska. And that's his focus of study is the Rufus hummingbird. We were fortunate to find this bird uh, coming into the scene as we were photographing this tall scarlet fritillary in uh, Table Rocks area, BLM land in Oregon. This is the, uh, the luckiest, the most fortunate photograph in a book. As you can see, this is a tall, uh, uh, very, very tall lily. The lily was moving in the wind. I uh, waited till the flower stopped. I had my eye on the viewfinder, my finger on a remote uh, camera release. The bird came in, I got two frames. It visited two different flowers and it was gone. So um, you, this is an, a, another example on the left-hand side right. of our, I'm sorry, thank you. On the right-hand side of the raw capture that Came and again, bringing up the saturation and the contrast. So we're, we're educating people about the pollinators and the importance of planting native gardens. Susan Twight wrote about the five deserts in California. Most people only know about four of them. Robin Wall Kimmerer, you may know her from her book, Braiding Sweetgrass, which is Native American uh, botanist and professor and mother, and she wrote a wonderful story about what's in a name, about the naming of, of flowers. Wendy Takuda, Zen in the Art of Pulling Broom, very funny story. Amber Paris, who works with children, talking to children about climate change without scaring them. Genevieve Arnold works with Theater Pain Foundation in the LA area, and she's in charge of their seed bank. There's also a section in the book on fire recovery, fire ecology, the beautiful plants that that come back after a fire had gone through. The previous uh, image was a was of a fire poppy that we photographed in Cleveland National Forest in Southern California. And it's considered a fo a fire follower. It shows up mostly after a fire. And we also photographed. Uh, in, in addition, this is Santa Ana Mountains again. Um, we also photographed the aftermath of flat fires in Lake County. And this is just about six months after some of the devastating fires that went through. In this scene, the entire area had been completely burned. You can see this manzanita uh, was just totally scorched. And this was what came back afterward. Uh, the pink flowers are Clarkia, and they are abundant after fires go through an area. Yeah, called ribbon Clarkia. And bulbs are particularly uh, take advantage of the situation and thrive after a fire. Um, the ash becomes fertilizer. Some plants are actually germination, or some of the seeds are actually germinated by um the chemicals that are in the smoke and the ash. And then if you have good rain, as well as now the overstory has been burned away, so they get a lot more sunlight. So as climate change brings us more, more fires, we see more of these beautiful floral events that happen after the fires go through. But if the fire is too hot, as some of them are, they fuse the soil and the rain can't penetrate, and then you don't have of vegetation returning in this way. 
this this marrow this meadow had been completely burned and this was came back at this is what came back afterward this was a little bit farther down the road from that previous image these are all spreads in the book this area uh, uh pepperwood preserve in sonoma county had been burned you can see the burned trees in the background this was what came back after the fire had gone through and this was the tubs fire that went into santa rosa Nita found these two flowers in that area right right next to each other. We didn't move them. I think this is a really nice striking composition of beautiful different color contrasts that complement each other. And we're going to take you um, fairly quickly through some of our favorite areas. This is Death Valley, some of our favorite deserts, I should say. And one of the things we love about the desert is that you you have all this geology and this um, you can see for for miles. And in some areas, you won't think you have much in there, but if you look closely enough, we found this broom rape in among the rocks. And also this uh, uh, rambling milkweed with a crab spider on it. So our first big super bloom was in 1998 in Death Valley. And they actually called them 100 year blooms back then because usually the conditions only came together once every 100 years. But as climate change is doing the deluge and then the, the extended drought, you're getting more super blooms, but the plants are really getting, and the wildlife is really getting stressed in between. This is jo uh, Joshua Tree National Park that's known for its beautiful granite formations. This the granite weathers into these coarse granitic soils, and it's fascinating to see these ground details where flowers come out come up out of uh, a background that looks like would not support any life at all. This is a typical desert wash in a typical uh, rain year in southern Joshua Tree. Uh, on the right hand side is what happened in 1998 again with these abundant rains. The flowers uh, just sprouted out of this granitic soil because the rains lasted so longer. The, there were so many more flowers that grew taller and taller with more blossoms. So this is what happens when climate change creates these abundant rainfall years. So there's the good and the bad on that on that the changes in the weather. And we just love the diversity, the diversity in shapes, the diversity in colors, the diversity in size that are found among wildflowers. Anza Borrego Desert State Park has also been a favorite place. It has gotten, um, it was in the news a lot during the last uh, super bloom because there were so many people that there were traffic jams and people running out of gas, et cetera. So the conditions, uh, what has happened has changed quite a bit compared to when we first started going out to the desert. There'd be a few thousand people, and then now there can be a hundred thousand people. This was unusual fog in Anza Borrego. We were there for 12 days. We'd go out for uh, three weeks to a month at a time, and out of 12 days, there was some rain on nine of those days. So this is where it all started in the Antelope Valley California Poppy Reserve. I think this was a digital image that was taken at well, maybe about 12 years after the first image we talked about in the beginning of the slideshow. That area has some beautiful ground details with uh, different colored flowers mixed in. This, was, this became the cover for our book. We photographed this after uh, uh, all the beautiful work we had done uh, around the town of Gorman that we talked about earlier. Uh, so, and you can see that it's only poppies. So after this image, we're going to give you some slides that have information that we feel is, is valuable, and we'll return to more pages in the book later. And we're just going to quickly take you through our personal garden on our property. This was a um, cedar waxwing that we photographed out our bedroom window. It is eating the berries on the cotone aster. Cotone aster is not a native. It is actually a very nasty invasive. 
So we cut down the Katoni aster and we've been encouraging as much toyon, which is native to grow and produce berries on our property. So this is a wonderful plant for feeding birds. If you wanna learn more about what to grow in your area, um, CNPS has Calscape. That website has a garden planner so you can find out what's best to actually grow in your, in your area with your type of elevation and, and land. Um, we have Ceanothus and other plants to support pollinators and monarch butterflies. Our narrow leaf, uh, narrow leaf milkweed um, is obviously a favorite of the monarch butterfly. This is about 13 days later. They really, they really um, gorge themselves. And we brought two of them inside and they pupated in a, in a tank that we had and then we released them as they came out. This is the biggest dragonfly I'd ever seen was also on our milkweed. The blossoms the seeds of the milkweed. It's all from our garden. And the milkweed is spreading really nicely this year. A few other flowers that are found on our property. Ceanothus in particular is great for pollinators. It also has a wonderful scent. The deer do eat this particular one. If you look really super close at the flowers, it's really interesting to see what the individual flowers look like. In this case, you can see little grains of pollen. You want late color and late um, flowers. The Pacific, uh, the California fuchsia is one that, that blooms really late in the season. Pacific aster, if you have an area that you want to uh, cover, that, that will spread as well with runners. So our project is about how to make a difference and we encourage people to take the actions that suit them or all of them to, to really help, help this planet. You can also become a citizen scientist with iNaturalist and Nature's Notebook and there will be an email, follow-up email sent out with a lot of these links. This helps scientists around the world with the data. Some of the images, some of the flowers in the book were taken out of state because we hadn't found that flower yet in the state. This is an example of a prickly poppy we found in the Great Basin Desert in Nevada. So if there are images that uh, we had found, there are flowers we had found out of state that had not yet photographed here. We included them in the book because that species did live here, does live here. We're also looking for interesting backgrounds behind the flowers. This is, uh, the background is serpentine rock, which is the state rock. And there are other beautiful places we photographed, such as Table Mountain. Which is uh, near Chico. And I've heard because it's gotten inundated at times with people uh, walking all, all over the flowers, they have changed the way, the access to it. So if you want to go there, I would double check on how, how to uh, visit it. So we, we just want to show you some more double page spreads in the book. And now you know how we get all the lighting that you see on these Flower, flower portraits that look like they were done in a studio. We never pick the flowers. And if you're looking for a way to I, uh, ID plants other than on your iPhone, there's some good apps now is plantid.net is particularly good for beginners. Calflora is more advanced. Wildflower Report resource, especially good for Southern California is the Theater Pain Foundation has a great hotline. CNPS has a Facebook page, page that you can join and see what people are posting or ask questions. And desertusa.com is also something that we've used a lot to see what's happening. And just a few more images and we'll be done. And again, we just love the diversity of the shapes and sizes that we find out there.
And one of the things we're gonna be working on is creating some children's books as well. And we are a, um, a sponsored project of Marin Link. And I'll talk about that in a moment, actually. So the book has a nice section on the ecological re regions of California, the short descriptions of, uh, of different places in the state. It has a glossary. There are, uh, as Nina mentioned, there are 18 essays by uh, a variety of different authors that may contain uh, terms that some people may not understand. So we we put in a nice glossary and there are also two indices, a plant name index and a location index. So if you wanted to know what we photographed in Death Valley, you can look that up. So we have two versions of the book. We have the regular edition book, which we'll show you in a, we'll hold up once we uh, stop the slideshow. And we have a deluxe signed limited edition book that comes with a special cover, a uh, signed and numbered tip-in page and a clamshell box. If you have access to the regular edition book, we encourage you to peel back the paper jacket to see this special cover on the back. And there was a lot of Marin involved in this book. Our designer, Laura Lovitz from Marin County. Um, Elizabeth Patak was our editor. She lives in Inverness. Um, our printer was, uh, broker was based in Marin County. So as I mentioned, we're a sponsored project of Marin, MarinLink.org. Um, we are, working on making nature's beauty accessible to the visually impaired and those without access to nature. So we would love any tax deductible donations from individuals or businesses. And um, we'd love to hear from you. Oops, I missed it. What is going on? This is, oh, there we go. So thank you all for uh, watching our presentation. I hope uh, you learn what it was we did and why we do it and how climate change is affecting our beautiful wildflowers. And again, wildflowerbooks.com is the uh, book's website. And um, you can buy books and have them shipped or you can purchase a book and actually pick it up at our home in Marin City. We also are going to be at the depot from about four to five, four to five thirty this afternoon. If anybody has additional questions or wants to meet us in in person, um, we welcome you to do that. We like to end with this wonderful quote quote from David Brower, uh, something that we believe in uh, in the deepest parts of our heart: truth and beauty can still win battles. We need more art, more passion, and more wit in defense of the earth. So thank you all for staying with our presentation. It's been an hour and one minute. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Nita. And thank you all for joining us this afternoon. What an inspiring presentation. I hope everyone enjoyed the beautiful photography and learned as much about wildflowers and climate change as I did. We are going to extend the program to answer any questions, but if you have to leave now, you can email questions to nita at winterbadger.com. You can see that address and other links in the chat, and they, the links will also be in a follow-up email. So now, if you can stay around for a bit, please post questions in the Q&A. And we do have one question from Jane already, who wants to know if DEET or other insect repellents would have protected you from the noceums. It probably would have. Um, part of the problem was we were in the park and we didn't have access to, to buy it. When we finally left the area, we, we bought some um, insect repellent. But what I've found has worked pretty well is um, Avon Skin So Soft has worked well with mosquitoes and is not as uh, toxic as DEET. And uh, we unfortunately didn't, I didn't bring it with me. I didn't even think we were gonna have that issue. And so I didn't get to test it with the noceums, but with mosquitoes, it helps. I have a question actually. Um, 
do you, do you know the names of all these wildflowers that you're 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 finding, or is that something you've been learning over the years, or do you well, identify them later using one of, like iNaturalist? Yeah, uh, we have a lot of different books, uh, plant eye identification books that we use. We depended on a lot of our friends, uh, professional botanists and things like that. If we couldn't find it online, Pal Flora uh, mm -hmm. is a really, really good website, but you have to know something to be able to put it in. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, some of these plants, we had no idea what they were. And really? Yeah. And we have been uh, we have at times photographed non-natives to find out later they weren't natives. So we were <laughs> I wondered, sure. yes. But uh, my degree was in biology. So this was sort of full circle. Um, but I was on the East Coast where the flowers, many of the flowers were different. And so we still don't always remember that, the names and we'll go look them up. And um, But the ones in the book, we pretty much know by now. I'll yeah. bet you do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much for um, presenting this amazing book and telling us the story of your lives and, and the way you work. It's It's been wonderful. Thank you. Well, thank you for hosting us. We yeah. truly appreciate it, helping us get the word out there. Great. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank uh -huh. you.